tragic story of a ship that was once touted as unsinkable has been told time and time again. The Titanic's disastrous maiden voyage is still considered by some to be one of the most tragic maritime disasters in history. Over 1,500 passengers and crew perished when the ship struck an iceberg and sank in less than three hours. Those last moments were filled with confusion and terror, but the courage of everyone on board was never forgotten. Mm. The night of the disaster, many passengers had already turned in for the evening and gone to sleep. None expected any danger to be amiss, as the weather was quite still and the skies were beautifully clear throughout the day. A slight jolt felt by a first-class passenger, Edith Rosenbaum, was the only indication that something had occurred. After noticing her room was now at a slight list, she hurried to the forward part of the ship. There, she came upon a group of young men playing with bits of ice. As she picked up a piece, she was stunned by the coldness. Miss Rosenbaum turned to an officer and asked if she should be concerned, but he assured her. We have struck an iceberg, but there is no need to worry, and the best thing to do is to go back to bed. Not too far from Miss Rosenbaum was Mr. Francis McCaffrey and Mr. Thomas Beatty. The two friends were also first-class passengers. Their stateroom was in a forward-facing cabin whose window directly faced the electric cranes that had lifted everyone's luggage on board. Both men were in their 40s and were likely coming back from an evening of gambling or cigars when the iceberg hit. In the second-class cabins was the Allison family. They were just beginning to find sleep when they felt an even bigger disturbance. The jolt alarmed the family nurse, who hurried as she got little Helen Allison, just two years old at the time, and her baby brother dressed. Mr. Allison went up to the deck to find out why the ship had suddenly stalled. Soon after, an officer approached Mrs. Allison's cabin door and advised her to put on their life belts and to prepare to leave the ship. She immediately became hysterical. By this time, most passengers were finally beginning to realize the ship was in dire trouble and leaving the ship may be inevitable. Tragically, lifeboats were not a privilege for most passengers because there was only enough for half of those on board the doomed ship. It was ordered that women and children were to board the boats first, but very few were willing to get into the small wooden boats. Down below in steerage, Third-class passengers stood in panic with their feet already soaked in freezing cold water. They had been locked behind the gates with no access to the lifeboats. Anyone near the cargo hold had already drowned. The loss of life was increasing by the minute. First-class passenger Benjamin Guggenheim was seen helping people get to safety. After he finished his duty, Rose Emily saw him go back to his stateroom. When he returned in his evening dress, she overheard him say, We've dressed up in our best, and we are prepared to go down like gentlemen. Those working in the boiler stayed behind to keep the electricity on. Wireless officer Jack Phillips refused to abandon his post and continued to get their distress call out to surrounding ships. The Carpathia responded but was too far to save them. Alice Catherine Cleaver, the Allison family nurse, had grown tired of Mr. and Mrs. Allison's frightful attitude. It was slowing them down. She insisted on taking the baby into a lifeboat and then lost track of the parents in the confusion. Mrs. Allison finally reached a lifeboat along with her two-year-old daughter, but she couldn't bear the thought of separating from her baby boy, so she jumped out and ran to find the lifeboat her family nurse had jumped into. Meanwhile, Mr. McCaffrey and Mr. Beatty, like all men aboard the ship, found themselves trapped as they were not allowed in the lifeboats. All around them were panicked families who were scrambling for seats on the last lifeboats. Some wives refused to separate from their husbands and entire families stayed behind because their 12-year-old son or brother was not permitted to enter the lifeboats either. Miss Rosenbaum finally found her way to lifeboat number 11, but she was fearful of the mere size of it compared to the massive ship and did not want to get in. As she looked below in horror, an officer took her lucky musical pig from under her arm and threw it in. She then let the officer help her into the lifeboat to safety. Ava Hart, just seven years old, cried as she said goodbye to her father for the last time. 
Her sorrow only worsened when she remembered she left her favorite dolly behind as well. Her mother, Emily Hart, felt the sting of regret as her sense of impending doom as she first boarded the ship proved to be true. Little Ava Hart could hear the band playing Near My God to Thee as the lifeboat floated further away from the sinking ship. Titanic was taking on water at extremely high speeds and was disappearing under the surface quickly. Mrs. Allison clutched onto her daughter as she realized she had missed the last lifeboat during her haste to find her son. She was last seen smiling with her family on the pomade deck when they were rushed with icy water and drowned. Mr. McCaffrey and Mr. Beatty made it to the roof of the officer's quarters where the last collapsible lifeboat was available. The ship's increasing list made it more difficult for passengers still aboard to stay on two feet. As freezing water washed overboard, Mr. Beatty was able to keep the lifeboat steady and above water, but his friend disappeared. Young Ava Hart would watch in horror from her lifeboat as Titanic's stern rose upwards towards the stars. She didn't blink when the ship began to break in half with ear-splitting explosions. As Titanic slipped below the black waters, the desperate screams of those trapped on board were deafening, but was soon followed by dead silence. Miss Rosenbaum played her musical pig throughout the night to keep the children from crying. Other survivors sat in silence as they attempted to understand the tragedy that had just occurred. It was hours before they were finally rescued by the Carpathia. As they climbed aboard, they were given whiskey and crackers to warm them. The survivors fully assumed another ship was coming along to unite them with their husbands and loved ones, but they were sadly mistaken. The Carpathia was now a ship of widows and orphans, Captain Arthur Rochon did his best to accommodate the traumatized survivors, but the ship was not ready for almost 800 unexpected passengers. Many had to sleep on floors or were at the mercy of guests of the ship who allowed them to share their stateroom. It was a long, tiresome journey to New York City from there. When the survivors arrived, they were met with huge crowds of loved ones who were eager to reunite with their families and reporters lined the dock, ready to get the story. The survivors were at a major loss. Men were not allowed on the lifeboats, so many families lost their source of income. Immigrants who were looking to start a new life in America had to consider moving back home, and some did. The investigation into the Titanic disaster left little blame on White Star Line. This left families with little recourse. Many received settlement amounts that did not equal the value of what was lost at sea that night. Sadly, months later, Mr. Thompson Beatty was discovered along with two firemen still adrift in their lifeboat. All three had died from exposure. It is not known how the lifeboat was not recovered by the Carpathia or other surrounding ships at the time of the sinking or shortly after. The Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable, but it was not built to be immune from disaster. The White Star Line prided itself on their innovative watertight compartments, only to equip their new ships with a faulty design that let water easily overflow into the surrounding compartments after the watertight doors were sealed. The publicity surrounding the maiden voyage of this ship far surpassed the truth. This over-the-top, magnificent, giant ship, the Titanic, was supposed to be the ship of dreams, but instead it was an illusion. The illusion that men can create something that not even God could sink, and that wealth made you invulnerable. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more about the Titanic or see some awesome artifacts from the Titanic Museum in Las Vegas, please watch Discovering Titanic on the Outseers channel. Thanks for watching.